Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Ed Flynn, and I am the City Council President. Viewers can watch the City Council meeting live on YouTube by visiting boston.gov slash citycouncil-tv. I'd like to ask my colleagues and those in the audience to please silence your cell phones and electronic devices. Thank you. I'd also like to ask everyone to be respectful of each other and do not disrupt the meeting while you are here. If you are disruptive, you will be asked to leave, and if you fail to comply, you'll be escorted out. Please also note that according to City Council rules, there are no signs allowed in the chamber. Mr. Clerk, will you please call the roll to ascertain the presence of a quorum? Councilor Fernandez Anderson. Here. Councilor Flaherty. Yeah. Councilor Flynn. Here. Councilor Lara. Here. Councilor Lu Jen. Here. Councilor Mejia. Here. Councilor Murphy. Here. And Councilor Worrell. Thank you, Mr. Clerk. Can you please ensure the record is reflected that Councilor Arroyo was present? Yes. <clears throat> the introduction of the clergy. Um, Today, we're, we're honored to have um, Councillor Coletta introduce our clergy today, who is a, a priest from Saint, Sacred Heart Church in East Boston. Um, Councillor Coletta, will you please come to the podium? Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I am so honored to introduce Father Paolo Kuman from Sacred Heart Church in East Boston. Um, a little bit about him before he provides our invocation this morning. Uh, Father Paolo was born in Trieste, Italy in 1973. After schooling, he joined the seminary of the fraternity of St. Charles Borromeo in Rome. In 2001, he was ordained deacon and assigned to the mission of the fraternity in Taiwan. After 10 years in Taiwan and a short visit back to Italy, he arrived in Boston in the beginning of 2012 and taught math at Cristo Rey High School in Dorchester. In June 2013, Cardinal Sean O'Malley entrusted the pastoral care of St. Clement Church in Medford and Somerville, where he taught math and religion at St. Clement High School for four years. After the parish had closed in June 2017, Father Paolo served as vicar at the Beverly uh, a church um, and later appointed chaplain at the Shrine of Our Lady of Good Voyage in the Seaport District in Boston. Uh, in 2020, East Boston welcomed Father Paolo back to Sacred Heart Parish Church in East Boston. Uh, and Sacred Heart, just a personal note, is where I uh, received communion, it's where I was confirmed, it's where I was baptized, and I'm thrilled to see how this church community has thrived since his arrival. Um, in partnership with the community, he's recently created a hot meal soup kitchen at the church once a month, and the next uh, hot meal soup kitchen is occurring on Wednesday, April 12th, and all are welcome to join. So um, again, it's my, my honor to welcome Father Paulo here to the council. Please join me in giving him a warm reception. Thank you, Councilor Coretta. Uh, I have to say I feel a little bit intimidated to be here in front of U.S. team officials of the city of Boston and the residents of the city. Thank you for inviting me in front of this noble honor assembly on this week that's very special for many of us. For us Catholics and many Christians, it's Holy Week, the week in which we are celebrating the core foundations of our faith, which is the passion, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Next week, the Orthodox churches will celebrate the Easter liturgies. Tonight, the Jewish Passover is beginning, and we are in Ramadan, the holy month observed by Muslims. It's a spiritual, rich, and intense time. To serve is always an honor and a task, particularly in serving the civil and political officials. One of the documents of the Catholic Church in the Second Vatican Council declares that the political community exists for the sake of a common good, in which it finds its full justification and significance and the source of its inherent legitimacy. Indeed, the common good embraces the sum of both conditions of a social life whereby men, families, and associations more adequately and readily may obtain their own perfection. One of the fathers of the church once said, 
to serve is to reign. Those words were echoed by Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., who once said, everybody can be great because everybody can serve. You don't have to have a college degree to serve. You don't have to make your subject and your verb agree to serve. You only need a heart full of grace and a soul generated by love. In serving, we need to prioritize, to give priority to the common good over our own ideas and interests. To have a good of ones to serve always in mind and to have a heart full of grace. We also need guidance, strength, humility, and mutual listening. So let us set in prayer. I invite you to join praying according to your own tradition or simply listen respectfully. Dear wise and loving God, Father of Jesus Christ and our Father, thank you for your many and abundant blessings. Thank you for loving us. We are all limitations and failures. Thank you for the gifts of these men and women that have been chosen by us, citizens of Boston, to promote our common good. Therefore, I pray you for a mayor and for this assembled council. I'm asking that you will graciously grant them understanding to discern the true needs of our people, wisdom to govern with justice and righteousness, deep and true knowledge of your plans and the good of the people they serve, courage to make decisions, decisions they deem necessary by required sacrifice, reverence for you and respect for one another, right judgment to govern amid the conflicting interests and issues of our times, a healthy and filial fear of offending you and letting down the people they serve. Father, please guide them so that this meeting can be productive. Bless the servants of the citizens of Boston as we place this meeting in your hands, that the decisions may benefit all those who live and work in and around our beloved city. It is in your name that I pray. Amen. Amen. Could you please join us in the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Father, for those inspiring words and, and in prayer. We have, a, we have a special presentation at this time, and before I introduce the special guest that we have, I'd like to ask the City of Boston Commissioner of Veterans Services, Rob Santiago, uh, to please come down. ask the Veterans Commissioner Santiago um, to introduce our, our guests and as the Commissioner is speaking, could I also ask the Gold Star Wives, Gold Star Spouses, would you please come forward and join us at the podium? Council President Flynn, City Councilors, uh, and guests. Today, April 5th, is Gold Star Spouses Recognition Day. But before I recognize these spouses that are, are lining up behind me, I want to tell you a little bit about what the Gold Star symbol is all about. The Gold Star symbol began back during World War I when families hung banners with blue stars representing family members in service. And if the service member passed, the blue star was replaced by the Gold Star. The term Gold Star Family, Gold Star Spouses, and Gold Star Wives traditionally refer to the surviving loved ones of military members who lost their lives in the line of duty. We, everyone in this chamber, everyone in the city of Boston, in the Commonwealth, and in this country, 
are indebted to the men and women in our armed forces as we remember those who have died in service to our country. We must also remember the spouses and the families that are left behind who have suffered the great loss of their family member for the sake of our country. The United States Congress uh, designated April 1st as Gold Star Spouses Day back in 2013 in recognition of the sacrifices made by the spouses and family members are fallen heroes. These spouses, they never asked to be a member of the Gold Star community, but they are, and we are truly indebted to them. When our service members are overseas and they're serving our country and they don't come back, it's because of the families that are behind them, uh, behind me, I'm sorry, as to why they will always be remembered and honored, and all of us are indebted to that. So I would like to recognize all of the spouses that are behind me today. Marilyn, uh, Marion Dennehy, Francis Waltman, Mary Lou Gauguin, Donna Brown, Pamela Hart, Donna Masaskic, Ellen Savage, Sharon Gauguin, Mary, uh, Maureen England, Amy Rippey, Maria Sousa, Patricia Stanhope, Peggy Griffin, and Jeanette N. Rose. It is my honor to recognize our Gold Star Spouses. I have the opportunity to introduce Peggy, who's the president of the Gold Star Spouses, and I think Commissioner Santiago summed up the, this organization as well as I've heard um, ever. So I want to say thank you to Commissioner Santiago. And we're not celebrating or promoting the Gold Star wives, spouses, but what we're here to do is to share in the pain that they have lost. They, they have that pain every day of the year. But as a nation, on this day, even if it's only one day out of 365, on this one day, it's also appropriate for us to share in that pain and that hurt that their spouse um, is, has, been, has been gone but not forgotten. And as we advocate, and all of my colleagues here do an exceptional do job, but as we advocate for services for and programs for Gold Star families and Gold Star spouses, they're not getting anything. We're not giving them anything. They've earned everything through their pain, through their suffering through their heartache that they experience every day of the year. And it's not just on this day, but every day of the year they think of their, they think of their spouse, they think of their, their children that didn't have a, 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 a husband um, to raise them or, or being grandparents now. So we, we share in that pain. We recognize that pain, suffering, and heartache, and at this time, it's appropriate for me as a city council president and, and as a United States Navy veteran, along with Commissioner Santiago as a United States Navy veteran, um, to honor our Gold Star families, Gold Star spouses today, introducing Peggy. Thank you, um, Council President Flynn and all the members and, and the members of the public. I wanted to take a few minutes just to tell you a little bit about Gold Star Wives, our organization. Today marks the first day that the American widows of World War II met in 1945. So it's our 78th anniversary of being an organization. The Greater Boston chapter of Gold Star Wives of America is the second oldest chapter in the United States. So we were the next to form, of course, right? Um, but what we do is uh, we help the survivors if someone served was died in action, died while on duty, or is the result of a service-connected disability of 100%, we are there to help um, the family, to refer them to what they might need. But also, one of the problems for widows, widowers, your social connections get cut 
when you lose your spouse. Financially, you lose roughly 75% of your income. Um, and what is replaced is, is simply barely surviving. So our group exists to provide advocacy, <clears throat> excuse me, and social networks. We also do a lot of veteran service programs. We recently did a program at the homeless shelter around the corner. We put together 50 baskets of supplies for veterans who would be moving from home, homelessness to homes so that when they get their apartment or their unit, they had something to put in it and to, to move on. So we rebuild, we give back, and um, we try to raise awareness. And I'm hopeful that many of you who don't know what we do will take this back to your communities. And if you have someone in your district who receives the DIC payments from the VA and they're not connected, we would very much like to help them be connected. They don't have to join, we'll help anyone. But you know, we're really looking to make sure people know who we are, what we do, and what we stand for. So thank you for the few minutes today. Thank you. Could I, ask my could I ask my colleagues to join us for a photo, please? No, you were excellent. You were excellent. You were excellent. <laughs> there you go, friend. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yes. 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 No, I think he wants to read the proclamation. Okay. You get that. Are you going to read it? Oh, I don't know. I never noticed it. Yeah. Oh, it's okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. My son's name was Marie. Thank you. I just want to thank the City Council for the recognition of our Gold Star spouses here today. I also want to mention uh, 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 Peggy, she sort of alluded to um, anybody who you know in the community who is receiving DIC uh, to contact them, but you could contact them through our office, Boston Veterans uh, Services. Uh, our email is, uh, or our, our website is boston.gov slash veterans. Please contact us for anything dealing with veterans. Uh, we would be more than happy to work with the veterans and their families to ensure that they get all the benefits and all the resources that they have earned. Again, thank you, Council President Flynn. Thank you, Commissioner Santiago. We're on to the approval of the minutes, which is the first order of business. Seeing and hearing no discussion on this matter, the chair moves to approve the minutes from the last meeting. All those in favor of approving the minutes from the last meeting say aye. aye. All opposed say nay. Thank you. The minutes of the last meeting stand is approved. Communications from her honor the mayor. Mr. Clerk, can you please read docket 0710, please? Docket number 0710, message in order for your approval, an ordinance governing construction and demolition operations in the city of Boston. This ordinance is a significant step in the city's efforts to reduce injuries and fatalities on construction and demolition sites in Boston, filed in the office of the city clerk on April 3rd, 2023. 
Thank you. This docket 0710 will be referred to the Committee on Government Operations. <coughs> Mr. Kerr, can you please read docket 0711, please? Docket number 0711, message in order for the confirmation of the appointment of Armindo Goncalves as a member of the Boston Water and Sewer Commission for a term expiring on January 4th, 2027. Thank you. This docket 0711 <coughs> will be referred to the Committee on uh, City Services, Innovation Technology, Reports of Public Offices and others. Mr. Clerk, please read docket 0712-0721. Docket number 0712, notice was received from the Mayor of the appointment of Rachel Kemp as a member of the Boston Election Commission Advisory Board for a term expiring March 31st, 2027. Docket number 0713, notice was received from the Mayor of the appointment of Gabriel Camacho as a member of the Boston Cannabis Board for a term expiring March 27, 2025. Docket number 0714, notice was received from the Mayor of the appointment of Michael Flaherty as a member of the Surveillance Oversight Advisory Board effective immediately. Docket number 0715, notice was received from the Mayor of the appointment of Hillary Robinson as a member of the Surveillance Oversight Advisory Board, effective immediately. Docket number 0716, notice was received from the Mayor of the appointment of Teresa Anderson as a member of the Surveillance Oversight Advisory Board, effective immediately. Docket number 0717, notice was received from the Mayor of the appointment of Ann Lee as a member of the Surveillance Oversight Advisory Board, effective immediately. Docket number 0718, notice was received from the Mayor of the appointment of Cade Crockford as a member of the Surveillance Oversight Advisory Board, effective immediately. And docket number 0719, communication was received from Lawrence S. Takara, Chairman of the Audit Committee, updating the City Council of their meetings held with independent auditors KB, KPMG LLP for the year ending December 31st, 2022. Docket number 0720. Communication was received from Sheila Dillon, Chief of Housing and, and Director, regarding the 2022 annual report on Boston's affordable housing. And docket number 0721. Communication was received from Nicholas Arinello as Assessing Commissioner of the appointment of Anthony Green as an Assistant Assessor. Thank you. These dockets 0712 through 0721. They'll be placed on file. Reports of committee, Mr. Clerk, please read docket 0576. Docket number 0576. The committee on ways and means to which was referred on March 15, 2023. Docket number 0576. Message in order for your approval and order authorizing the City of Boston to submit statements of interest to the Massachusetts School Building Authority. MSBA core program for the P.A. Shaw Elementary School and the Charles H. Taylor Elementary School pursuant to Massachusetts General Laws Chapter 70B, Section 5. The statement of interest describes and explains the deficiencies within each of the school facilities that prevent them from delivering their desired educational programs, submits a report recommending that the order ought to pass. Thank you. The Chair recognizes Councilor Fernandez Anderson, the Chair of the Committee on Ways and Means. Councilor Fernandez Anderson, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, the uh, Committee on Ways and Means, we held a hearing to on uh, this matter sp sponsored by the administration and referred to uh, my committee um, and docket uh, 0576 request approval to <coughs> submit statements of interest for funding consideration from the Massachusetts School Building Authority, MSBA core program to address deficiencies at the following schools. P.A. Shaw Elementary School 429, at 429 Norfolk Street, Dorchester, Mass, 02124. Charles H. Taylor Elementary School at 1060 Morton Street, Mattapan, Mass, 02126. Both schools will be submitted for improvements with each of the school facilities that prevent them from delivering their desired education program. The SOI for the facilities listed above described deficiencies submitted under priority number four, prevention of severe overcrowding, 
expected to result from increased enrollments. Priority number five, replacement, renovations, or modernization of school facility systems such as roofs, windows, boilers, heating, and ventilation systems to increase energy conservation and decrease energy related costs in a school facility and priority number seven, replacement of or addition to obsolete buildings in order to provide for a full range of programs consistent with the state approval local requirements. Um, and basically, uh, the information received here, um, the committee <coughs> held a public hearing on docket, uh, again, 0576 on Wednesday, March 29th. 2023, Brian McLaughlin, project manager um, at Boston Public Schools, Rebecca Grange, Granger, senior advisor for youth and schools at the mayor's office, uh, Delavern De Stanislaus, chief of capital planning at BPS, and Carlton Jones, assistant director of operations at the public facilities department. PFD test, uh, testified on behalf of the administration. Um, at this time, um, Mr. President, I am asking for this docket ought to pass. Thank you. And thank you, Council Fernandez Anderson. Thank you. Council Fernandez Anderson seeks acceptance of the committee report in passage of docket 0576. All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say nay. The ayes have it. Docket 0576 <coughs> has passed. We're on to matters recently heard for possible action. But before we do that, I just want to reread the opening statement that I had. I would like to ask again my colleagues and those in the audience to please silence cell phones, electronic devices, I'd ask everyone in this room to be respectful and do not disrupt the meeting while you are here. I'm asking everyone to be respectful of each other. If you are disruptive, you will be asked to leave, and if you fail to comply, you will be escorted out. Again, there are no signs. We're on to Matt has recently heard for possible action. Mr. Clerk, please read docket 0154, please. Docket number 0154, order for a hearing on fire and emergency disaster relief services in the city of Boston. The chair recognizes Councilor Bach, the chair of the Committee on City Services, Innovation <coughs> Technology. Councilor Bach, you have the floor. Thank you so much, Mr. President. Um, we held this hearing this week on Docket 0154, uh, which was co-sponsored by Councilors um, Louis Jen, Braden, and Flaherty. Um, this is about the city's uh, fire and emergency disaster relief services. We were joined by a great kind of interdepartmental team. So we had Commissioner Burke from the fire department, Connor Newman from ONS, um, Chief Benford from OEM, uh, Danielle Johnson, our um, Deputy Dire Director at Mayor's Office of Housing, and Eliza Wasserman from the Office of Food Justice um, on the administration <coughs> panel, really talking about how all those agencies um, uh, collaborate when we ha do have a um, fire or other disaster. Um, and then we heard after them from uh, the Red Cross and uh, NOAA, two of our major partners, um, and we heard from the City of Cambridge. And so I think main takeaways, Mr. President, were one was just, you know, the City of Cambridge actually has a fund vehicle for people to donate to support disaster relief um, so that there can be like private philanthropic funds that help with these big moments. And um, I think it was really interesting to hear about that and the structure of that trust. And it seemed like a good potential complement to the work that our departments do. So I think there was definitely a takeaway around that. Um, I think that, you know, we all continue to struggle with the fact that there is like a, a little bit more of a, um, of a like substantive resource based response for fires than for other types of disasters. So talked a lot um, about the fact that when we've got water main breaks or uh, floods based on pipes bursting or building collapses, things where there might be a landlord at fault or there might be a dispute with Boston Water and Sewer about who's at fault, that we know that the people who are impacted, the tenants of those buildings are not the ones at fault. And so how do we kind of get that, um, that emergency response and follow up to them? Um, so I think, I think some good kind of lines of inquiry for focusing more on that uh, came out of this. And um, 
and yeah, it was just all around a great conversation. I was joined in addition to the co-sponsors, um, Councillors Lou, Jen, Braden, and Flaherty again, joined by Councillor Coletta, uh, Councillor Mejia, and yourself, Mr. President. Um, and uh, I think definitely a topic of ongoing conversation and um, would want to keep it in committee. Thank you. Thank you, Council Bach. Docket 0154 will remain in committee. Mr. Clerk, please read docket 0630, please. Docket number 0630, order for a hearing to discuss the ban of miniature alcohol bottles, also known as singles, in the city of Boston. Can we take a brief, brief recess? We are back in session. <coughs> Mr. Clerk, can you please um, let the record be reflected that Council Rell is present? At this time, um, the Chair recognizes Council Rell, the Chair of the Committee on Small Business Professional Licensure. Council Rell, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, Council President. Um, the Small Business and Professional Licensure Committee met on Monday, April 3rd at 3 p.m. for an initial hearing considered banning, banning uh, miniature alcohol bottle sales. Uh, the meeting was attended by Councilor Arroyo, who is the sponsor of this bill, um, of this hearing, uh, Councilor Flynn, Councilor Flaherty, Councilor Louis Jen, and Councilor Lara. We also received a letter of absence from Councilor Murphy. Um, this hearing was additionally attended by Chairman Joyce, Dr. Ojukutu, as well as representatives from Chelsea to discuss the positive impacts the ban had in Chelsea relating to environmental pollution, business, and health. This was, this was the first and ongoing discussion to consider implementing such a ban. We will continue to hold space for the discussion to ensure that community members have the opportunity to have their voices heard. I recommend this, um, this um, hearing remains a committee, and I defer to the sponsor for further comment. Thank you, Council Worrell. The Chair recognizes Council Arroyo. Council Arroyo, you thank have the you, floor. President. I'll be brief. I just want to thank uh, the representatives from Chelsea, the Chief of Police, uh, former City Council President, former Licensing Board President, uh, Roy Avagineta, uh, Norton, uh, City Council Norton from uh, Newton, uh, and a number of other experts who we had here, including folks from the administration. Uh, I think this is an uh, issue worthy of our time and of our work, uh, and I look forward to having conversations in the future uh, on moving forward as a city on uh, taking the actions and the steps of, of making sure that these uh, miniature bottles are banned uh, and sailed uh, in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Council Royal. This docket 0630 will remain in committee. Mr. Clerk, please read docket 0148, please. Docket number 0148, order for a hearing regarding contraception and menstrual product vending machines in the city of Boston. The chair recognizes Councilor Murphy, the chair of the Committee on Public Health, Homeless, Homelessness, Recovery. Councilor Murphy, you have the floor. Thank you, President Flynn. Um, Yesterday, we held a meeting in the Committee of Public Health, Homelessness, Recovery, and Mental Health to take testimony and consider this matter to incorporate. Um, I, I want to thank councils who were present and the three co sponsors. We had Councilor Gabriella Coletta, Councilor Ruzzi Louis Jean, and Councilor Ricardo Arroyo, who were all co sponsors, and we were also joined by Council President Flynn. I want to thank the administration, um, Alexandra Valdez, who is the director of the Mayor's Office of Women Advancement. She was one of our panelists, and also the community leader and advocate, Sasha Goodfriend, who is the executive director of the Mass Now, Massachusetts chapter of National Organization for Women. We had a great conversation. We learned a lot um, of how the city is behind, unfortunately, we found out. And things that we can do to partner with nonprofits, community centers, and others to get this matter, um, you know, to, to address the needs here. So if uh, my co-sponsors, Councilor Coletta, um, Louis Jenna Ricardo, would like to speak briefly on this matter, that's great, but I am requesting, President, that this remains in committee. Thank you. 
Thank you, Council Murphy. The chair recognizes Council Coletta. Council Coletta, you have the floor. Thank you, President Flynn. I want to thank the chair, Councilor Murphy, and my co-sponsors, uh, Councilor Louis Jen and Councilor Arroyo, for being there, uh, as well as you, uh, Council President Flynn, to, to talk about um, something that is largely stigmatized, even though half of our population, and I would argue more than half of our population, um, menstruates. We were talking about periods, everybody, and the fact that we're talking about it now is breaking down that stigma. Um, period poverty is, is real. So every single month, uh, women and folks who identify as women have to buy pads, tampons, and they are expensive. And largely, people are choosing them. What we learned from Sasha Goodfriend from, uh, from Mass Now, and we also invited Love Your Menses and Dignity Matters, um, is that people have to choose between food, prescriptions, uh, everything else in life, and then things uh, to help them when they menstruate. And so this was the focal point of this conversation. Uh, the, sec the second focal point of this hearing order was to talk about how we might be able to get um, contraceptions, uh, contraceptive uh, methods involved and included in these um, vending machines, but that is the second phase of this conversation. Right now we're just focusing on pads and tampons. Um, it certainly was an enlightening conversation. We learned that Boston is behind um, other municipalities, even in the state, and there are 21 states who have already required uh, municipal buildings and state buildings to have uh, these products in their bathrooms. Um, the idea of funding a pilot program to sponsor these vending machines was discussed. Uh, we were getting into the details of what it might take and how much money um, it, it might require to have these machines or, or boxes or whatever included in municipal buildings, including City Hall, as well as BCYF centers, libraries, and um, in our schools. And so we heard from Women's Advancement that a pilot program might need upwards of $125,000. So during budget process, please consider this a priority of mine. And I would welcome my colleagues to learn more about it and get involved in the conversation. Um, until then, in the interim, uh, there's also state legislation that's up at the State House um, through Mass Now and Sasha Goodfriend that would require these products in shelters, schools, and prisons. And so while we're waiting for that to happen, how are we getting these products out to folks who need them the most? And so the conversation also um, went into how we can put them in the hands of community health centers, uh, women's shelters, and nonprofit partners. Um, regardless, we should be exercising intentionality around identifying reproductive health deserts. I know that there's been a lot of talk about Walgreens and CVS um, locations closing. So ensuring that anything we're doing is serving our most uh, vulnerable populations. And then just thinking about best practices uh, when it comes to large-scale procurement and government purchasing, if we do decide to expand on a pilot program, thinking about how, uh, what we are investing in and tying in our climate and environment goals and making sure that we're purchasing biodegradable um, applicators and supporting local startups and uh, MWBEs. And so in future, conversation, uh, future conversations, I would like to have um, the Boston Public Health Commission there as well as BPS. So I look forward to those conversations and really welcome everybody to be involved because we do need to break down the stigma. Thank you. Thank you, Council Carter. This docket 0148 will remain in committee. Mr. Clerk, will you please read docket 0606? Docket number 0606, message in order for your approval an ordinance adopting the Department of Energy Resources Municipal Opt-in Specialized Stretch Energy Code. Thank you. The Chair recognizes Council Arroyo, the Chair of the Committee on Government Operations. Council Arroyo, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, last week I pulled this from the green sheets uh, and uh, due to the request from other councillors we held a meeting. Uh, yesterday, April 4th, on docket 0606, which was a message in order for our approval on an ordinance, an ordinance adopting the Department of Energy Resources uh, Municipal Opt-in Specialized Stretch Energy Code, which was sponsored by Mayor Wu. I'd like to thank my council colleagues for attending, Council President Flynn, Councilor Murphy, uh, Councilor Flaherty, Councilor Lara, Councilor Coletta, and Councilor Louis Jen. I'd also like to thank members of the administration for attending, Reverend Mariama White-Hammond, uh, Chief of Environment and Energy and Open Space, Dr. Allison uh, Breezes, uh, Commissioner of the Environment Department. Uh, the Specialized Stretch Code focuses on maximizing energy efficiency, reducing heating demands, and promoting efficient electrification by requiring new construction, new construction, and buildings undergoing major renovations to be as energy efficient as possible. Buildings that use only electricity as an energy source versus fossil fuels can eliminate their emissions when electricity comes from renewable resources. 
Uh, the specialized municipal opt-in code includes net zero building performance standards and is designed to achieve state greenhouse gas emission limits and sublimits. This code helps Massachusetts meet its goal of 50% greenhouse gas emissions reduction from the 1990 baseline levels by 2030 and to reduce emissions gradually to net zero by 2050. During the meeting, we heard from the administration on the process and timeline that occurred at the state level for the adoption of this code, which began in late 2018 and concluded in September of 2022. This process included passage of the Climate Act of 2021, which was signed by Governor Baker, which required the Department of Energy Resources to create this code, as well as numerous public comments and public hearing sessions. As chair of the Committee on Government Operations, I recommend passage of this committee report uh, to ensure there is no further delay for the city to opt in to this already existing legislation at the state level and to cement Boston as a leader in sustainability and climate resilience. So I am calling for a vote uh, on docket 0606. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank, thank you, Council Royal. The Chair recognizes Council of Flaherty. Whoever would like to speak on this matter, um, please um, please let us know. But the Chair recognizes Council Thank Flaherty. you, Mr. President. Uh, and I obviously appreciate the uh, the Chair of Government Ops work on this, as well as the Chair of the Environment. And uh, obviously appreciate the, the Mayor's efforts. And uh, we have heard from our friends in labor, uh, gas fitters, pipe fitters, plumbers, electricians, et cetera, uh, still don't feel that they uh, have had a seat at the table, uh, and it's for those reasons uh, that I'll be a no vote today. Uh, clearly, this is where we're going uh, as a city, as, as a state, um, and uh, I think it's important to note that a lot of our success stories have been about partnerships uh, and giving folks an opportunity to be heard and to have a seat at the table. So I do know that our steel workers union, as well as plumbers and pipe pitters, uh, gas fitters, et cetera, still have significant concerns as to what it's going to mean in their industry, what it's going to mean for uh, the men and women uh, that work in those unions, uh, fairly progressive unions, as you had mentioned, uh, Mr. President, and as well as their families. So uh, I know we have time. Uh, we don't have a lot of time. I do know that we have time through the chair asking uh, for additional time for the men and women of those unions to, to be brought up to speed on or at least to have an opportunity to be heard. Uh, short of that, I will have to be a no vote today, again, for the only reason being that our friends in labor uh, haven't had an opportunity to, to be heard. Short of that, um, you know, my sense is through the chair that the process will move forward, but if there's any inkling to allow for it a little additional time uh, for our steel workers, our pipe fitters, our plumbers, our electricians, uh, et cetera, to, 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 to be heard and to have a seat at the table, uh, I would appreciate that. Uh, that would obviously allow me to, to vote favorably, but short of that, I'll have to be a no vote today unless the chair reconsiders. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank, thank you, Council Flaherty. There is a question on the floor from Council Flaherty. I would give the opportunity to Council Royo to respond. Um, I won't repeat the question. You know exactly what the question is. Uh, the chair recognizes Council Royo. Thank you. No, I'm, I'm not reconsidering. I'm still calling for a vote. Thank you. Can you say that again? Council Royo, can you say that again? I didn't hear. I'm not reconsidering. I'm still calling okay. for a vote. Thank you. The chair recognizes Council Murphy. Thank you, Council President Flynn. I'm just rising to say that I do take it very, re uh, one of my biggest responsibilities is to make sure that everyone's voices is heard in every vote that we take on this council. And I do, and I've heard directly from unions and that they don't feel like their voice has been heard. We don't have to rush this vote. Once I feel comfortable that everyone has been heard and we can then come to a decision based on all of the facts, I would feel more comfortable voting. So I will be voting no today for that reason. Thank you. Thank you, Council Murphy. The Chair recognizes Council Mejia. Council Mejia, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. President. And I just want to be uh, mindful and just for the record, we talk a lot about all voices being heard. I know that there's been lots of issues that people have uplifted here on this council and have asked us to advocate around budgets and things of that nature. And when it comes to the voices of the people, oftentimes those voices go um, fall on deaf ears when it comes to uh, funding. So I just want to say, you know, for the record that, you know, we all pick and choose the battles that we uh, are considering and willing to die on. But if we're really serious about hearing everybody's voice, then we will start acting that way. Thank you, Council Mejia. Would anyone else like to speak in this matter? I'm going to speak on this matter, um, and then we'll go to a vote. But no one wants to speak? Council President Flynn, the floor is yours. 
Thank you, Council Arroyo. I'm also at the same place as some of my colleagues that spoke. This is normally an issue I would support. Environmental justice has been issues that I've always voted in support of over the last six years. And I think I still want to do that. But I, I, I can't do that if the, if the voices of working men and women across Greater Boston were not heard. This body has always been a supporter of organized labor, of labor unions, working men and women fighting for a decent wage. And I want to make sure that their voice is heard in this debate. I had the opportunity to talk to several of them, several labor leaders last night, and they asked exactly what Council Flaherty was asking. Can, can we give them a little bit of time so that they can weigh in and discuss this? And even though the Council will probably vote in favor of it, they just want a fair opportunity to express their position. And I think that's, I think that's fair as someone that represents a large community of working men and women, I want to make sure their voices are heard in this discussion. And it's not just the steel workers and the pipe fitters and the gas workers and the electrical workers. It's, it's all unions. They want to feel like they're part of the discussion <coughs> here in the council and not sure if we're doing that this time I just don't like the precedent it sets, it sets when we don't allow organized labor to speak on an important issue. Also, I have heard from the business community asking, asking about this as well, expressing if we're able to give some more time for them to weigh in in the development community as well, that play a critical role in Boston. But I would, I would be voting no because the in, in my opinion, other people may disagree, but in my opinion, organized labor, working men and women across Greater Boston were not heard during this debate, and I can't vote on something if working people are not part of the solution. Thank you, Council Royal. Thank you, Council President Flynn. Council Arroyo seeks acceptance of the committee report and passage of docket 0606. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed say nay. 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 Mr. Kirk, can we do a roll call vote? Roll call vote on docket number 0606. Council Arroyo. Aye. Council Arroyo, aye. Councilor Baker. Nay. Councilor Baker, nay. Councilor Bach. Aye. Councilor Bach, aye. Councilor Braden. Councilor. Excuse me one second. It's all blank. <laughs> Councilor Arroyo, yes. Councilor Baker, nay. Councilor Bach, yes. Councilor Braden, absent. Councilor Coletta? Yes. Councilor Coletta, yes. Councilor Fernandez Anderson? Yes. Councilor Fernandez Anderson, yes. Councilor Flaherty? No. Councilor Flaherty, no. Councilor Flynn? No. Councilor Flynn, no. Councilor Lara? Yes. Councilor Lara, yes. Councilor Louis Jean? Yes. Councilor Louis Jean, yes. Councilor Mejia? Si. Councilor Mejia, C. Si. Councilor Murphy? Yes. I mean, no. Sorry. Councilor Murphy, no. And Councilor Worrell? Yes. Councilor Worrell, yes. Docket number 0606 has received eight votes in the affirmative and four votes in the negative. Docket has passed. Yes. Mr. Clerk, please read docket 0145. Docket number 0145, order for a hearing to discuss the safety of light poles, bridges, and other public infrastructure in the city of Boston. The chair recognizes Council Bach, the chair of the Committee on City Services, Innovation, Technology, and Communities. Council Bach, you have the floor. 
Thank you, Mr. President. Um, Mr. President, we held this hearing yesterday, uh, co-sponsored by yourself uh, and Councillor Flaherty. Um, thank you to you both for joining, along with Councillor Murphy and Councillor Louis Jen. Um, we were joined by, uh, so this was obviously on the safety of, of light poles and other infrastructure. Um, it was provoked by an incident a few months back, but really took the hearing as an opportunity to talk about what our Public Works Department does in terms of proactive maintenance on, um, on everything in our portfolio, but especially focused on light poles, bridges, um, some of these other kind of major installations that the city has. So we were joined by Chief of Streets um, Yasha Franklin Hodge and also by uh, Vineet um, and Mike Donahue, um, sorry, Vineet Gupta and Mike Donahue um, from our street lighting division. Um, and uh, they, you know, we talked through a number of different things. We talked about the bridges, the collaboration with the state bridge inspectors on that front, we talked about light poles and the kind of um, urgent response that our street lighting team has to anything that's been knocked over or is leaning, et cetera. Um, we talked a bit about some of the jurisdictional challenges that we face in certain parts of the city and the need to make sure that no matter what, um, unsafe infrastructure is made safe, regardless of whether it's ours or the state's or another agency's. Um, one of the things we talked about a little bit was kind of where we see rapid degrading of infrastructure, how the department's deciding to um, kind of maybe change the specifications to deal with that issue long term. and so. Probably the most exciting news from my perspective that came out of this is that the city is officially changing its specification on those those plastic tactile pads that go on the pedestrian ramps, the yellow and then in historic districts, red ones that are constantly getting torn. Um, you know, it really hasn't been okay for accessibility that we're installing those and then they're rapidly getting torn and then they create an issue for the wheelchair and stroller like, you know, wheels as it stands. So um, the chief did announce that uh, they're gonna be switching to cast iron as the standard with a powder coating for color, but um, I think that's gonna be great for accessibility around the city. Um, but yeah, we couldn't discuss the exact incident um, that had provoked the thing, um, be, for the, provoked the filing because of uh, the possibility of ongoing litigation, but I think we talked broadly um, about about these issues and kind of uh, had yeah, a great conversation with the panelists. So Mr. Chair, I would request that this docket remain in committee. Thank you. This docket 0145 will remain in committee. Motions, orders, and resolutions. Mr. Clark, please read docket 0722. Docket number 0722. Council of Lara offer the following. Order for a hearing to review the good food purchasing program for Boston Public Schools. Thank you. The chair recognizes Council of Lara. Council of Lara, you have the floor. Thank you, President Flynn. I would like to suspend the rules and add Councilor Julia Mejia as the, one of the original co-sponsors. Councilor Lara, can you repeat that? I'm sorry, I didn't hear. I would like to add Councilor Mejia as an original co-sponsor. Council, Council Mejia is added. The chair recognizes Councilor Lara. Thank you, President Flynn. In 2019, this body passed the Good Food Purchasing Program Ordinance under the leadership of then Councilor, now Mayor Wu. The Good Food Purchasing Program is a collaborative citywide initiative that is led by the Office of Food Justice, and it's meant to really harness our institutional power, uh, food purchasing power specifically, to help achieve our social, environmental, and economic goals. The program provides a framework that uses five core values to guide our purchasing behavior and requires that city department and vendors adopt a good food purchasing standard. The ordinance focuses on transparency by requiring a baseline assessment, the creation of a six-month action plan, and that a public hearing hearing be held no later than 90 days after the completion of the baseline assessment. The baseline assessment is completed now and the City Council is on a 90-day deadline to hold a hearing. As the Chair of the Environmental Justice, Resiliency and Parks Committee, um, I'm really excited to be stewarding the food justice work alongside Director Wazerman and I look forward to finding a time to hold this hearing in a timely manner. Thank you. Thank you, Council Lara. The Chair recognizes Council Mejia. Council Mejia, you have the floor. Uh, Mr. President, I just want to make sure you can hear me. <laughs> just yes, I can, Council Mejia. I'm feeling it. Um, all right. So uh, I just wanted to thank my co uh, uh, thank Council Lara uh, for adding me as a co-sponsor. Um, what we see here in the city of Boston is that zero percent of the purchasing went to animal welfare. BPS failed to. Um, to uh, replacing 15% of the total weight of animal protein purchased with plant-based protein and or purchasing 15% of products that are third-party certified humane. So, you know, I'm really curious about what are the protein options for BPS students that are vegetarian or do not eat meat. What we have uh, realized is that, you know, BPS has received credit for taking requests 
um, steps to outreach to vendors with labor law violations. How does communication with vendors regarding labor laws, um, you know, violate and proceed? And I'm just curious, you know, as we continue to have these conversations, would BPS take any actions against food vendors if labor laws violations continue occurring? So there's lots to uh, dig into here, and I look forward to not only hosting the hearing, um, but uh, really thinking about what else can we be doing to ensure that BPS um, is purchasing food that um, comes from uh, socially disadvantaged uh, vendors like women and BIPOC farmers um, and all that good stuff. So thank you. Thank you, Council Mejia. Would anyone like to speak on this matter? Would anyone like to add their name? Please raise your hand, Mr. Kirk. Please add Council Arroyo, Council Bach, Council Fernandez Anderson, Council Coletta, Council Louis Jean. Councilor Murphy, Council Rell, please add the please add the chair. This docket 0722 will be referred to the Committee on Education. Docket 0723 has been withdrawn. Mr. Clerk, please read docket 0724. Docket number 0724, Councilor Coletta offer the following. Order for a hearing to discuss the digitization and trafficking, the tracking of parking regulations. Thank you. The chair recognizes Councilor Coletta. Councilor Coletta, you have the floor. Thank you, President Flynn. Um, I seek to add Councilor Braden as second co-sponsor and then uh, suspend rule 12 and add Councilor Flaherty as third. Councilor Coletta, we're not yet able to add Councilor Braden because she's not present. She's not here. Okay. Um, well then, we, Councilor Flaherty. We could, ask, we could add Councilor Flaherty. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, Council, Council Flaherty is out of the chair, recognizes Council Coletta. Thank you so much. Councilor Braden um, expressed interest in helping me uh, with this. So I'm, I'm calling this hearing to discuss efforts and resource allocation related to digitizing and tracking parking regulations in the city of Boston. Uh, the catalyst for this was a recent meeting with BTD discussing parking enforcement in my district. Enforcement has been a top priority of residents. I get calls all the time particularly from the Jeffreys Point Neighborhood Association, um, and just given the fact that we have a high level of density and very uh, small amount of parking spaces per units, um, and many airport travelers utilize our streets to store their cars while they go on a trip, and this allows them to avoid paying uh, airport lot fees, and so we really need a strong enforcement system in East Boston and just in other dense areas in my community, especially the North End and also uh, <coughs> Charlestown. In conversation, I wanted to get a snapshot of what our parking reg uh, regulations are to assess if we have adequate enforcement levels and if we need a budget push for more positions. I was told that we do not have an inventory of where our signs are or what they say. There is no tracking system that we can pull up to identify where residential parking, two-hour parking, or commercial parking is, let alone what, what the hours are, like I mentioned. In 2023, uh, I think that this is crazy to me that we don't have a modernized system that we can pull up like a GIS or, or a tracking system um, to give us a full accounting of where our own assets are. This has led to enforcement uh, depending on institutional knowledge being passed down from enforcement officer to enforcement officer. Um, ultimately, uh, if our employees don't have the tools to best serve our streets and our residents, then their quality of life will suffer. As we enter budget season, it's important to focus on the dire needs to modernize some of our outdated internal systems that directly impact uh, efficient city services. I'd like to utilize this opportunity to discuss what we need in terms of investment for uh, digital tools like the GIS mapping system um, that allows employees and the public to access information, request services, sign up for alerts, and enforce our parking regulations at the end of the day. So I look forward to, this, to the discussion and having BTD in the streets cabinet at the table. Thank you. And thank you, Council Coletta. The chair recognizes Council Flaherty. Council Flaherty, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. President, and uh, to the previous speech, thank you for including me as a co-sponsor. Very timely, uh, as we learned yesterday, that the administration is on the verge of announcing uh, a new permanent uh, commissioner for the Boston Transportation Department. I think they may have let it slip, but uh, uh, nonetheless, uh, perfect timing uh, for this order. Uh, and when you think about um, what um, Councilor Collette is talking about, um, you know, the, we know enforcement offices pay for themselves and more each shift. Uh, and it's also very precious revenue that we generate 
that help pay for these transportation uh, infrastructure upgrades that uh, we as a city continue to make. But uh, oftentimes when you go across this neighborhood like I do as an at-large counselor, um, signage is sometimes faded, uh, unreadable, uh, some signs are missing. And so having someone to have the ability, uh, you know, through digitization to, to be able, digitalization to be able to, um, to identify where those spots are, where we can get appropriate signage uh, and uh, appropriate enforcement. And then lastly, the issue that this body continues to struggle with, uh, with the transportation department, it's 2023, and we don't have the ability uh, to allow home health aides uh, and or physical therapists or in more dire situations, hospice uh, nurses and workers to come into our city uh, to service and take care of uh, our residents, uh, loved ones, family members, neighbors, without having to come out to a ticket or a tow. There has to be a system. I have to think that there's someone out there that has created a software that allows you to be a home health aide or physical therapist uh, or, or, or uh, some type of uh, adult daycare specialist uh, that you could uh, log on and or get, uh, put your license plate in so that when you're uh, performing that very vital, uh, important service for a resident of our city, uh, that if there is an enforcement officer, they type your thing in and it flashes up home health aid or hospice worker taking care of a resident at such and such a place. It, it's just uh, a, ma a matter of basic fairness and, 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 and being uh, responsive and humane to, to our residents. What happens now is when you talk to those home health aides and those hospice workers is they decide not to come to Boston. So we lose out on that talent. They decide not to come here. Oh no, I'm not gonna take that job because I'm gonna get ticketed a tote. They end up going to surrounding communities around Boston. So uh, we lose out uh, on, on the best and brightest in uh, passionate, talented uh, healthcare workers and hospice workers and physical therapists because of the pains of parking somewhere that uh, you either weren't aware of, you didn't see the sign, or you didn't have uh, a resident sticker. So I think in sum, uh, in, in joining with uh, Councilor Coletta, uh, looking at the issues that uh, she's focused here, but and then maybe being able to broaden that discussion to sort of do a full um, stem to stern on the transportation department and what we can do uh, to make our city uh, and our transportation department better, more effective, and to serve our city, our residents, and our visitors. Thank you, Mr. President, and look forward to an expedited hearing. Thank you, Council Flaherty. Would anyone else like to speak on this matter? Would anyone like to add their name? Please raise your hand. Mr. Clerk, please add Councilor Royo. Councilor Bach, Councilor Fernandez Anderson, Councilor Lara, Councilor Louis Jean, Councilor Mejia, Councilor Murphy, Councilor Rao, please add the chair. This docket 0724 will be referred to the Committee on City Services, Innovation, Technology. Mr. Clerk, please read docket 0725, please. Docket number 0725, Councilor Mejia offered the following Order for a hearing on contract and payroll implementation for unions in Boston Public Schools. Thank you. The chair recognizes Council Mejia. Council Mejia, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, the Boston City Council must ensure that collective bargaining agreements are being honored and implemented properly through the allocations of funds it has duly appropriated. The Boston City Council has voted previously to approve appropriations for Boston Public Schools to fulfill collective bargaining agreements with 11 public sector unions, which <coughs> represent over 9,000 City of Boston employees. These include, uh, this includes the Boston Teachers Union, Administrative Guild, SEIU Local 888, Custodians Association Local 1952, IUPATDC35, Cafeteria Workers AFSCME Local 230, Planning and Engineering SEIU Local 888, Storekeepers um, AFSCME Local 2814, Boston Association of School Administrators and Supervisors, Lunch Hall, Lunch Hour Monitors, Plant Administra uh, Administrators Association, School uh, Police uh, Patrolmen's Association, School Bus um, Monitors, United um, Steelworkers, Boston School uh, Superior Officers uh, Federation. We have learned that many of these union workers have experienced payroll difficulties and other issues when implementing new contracts. The Boston Public School Office of Human Capital has been unresponsive to workers' concerns and demonstrated 
poor communication with employees, the proper functioning of the City of Boston's Human Resource Department and the Boston Public School Office of Human Capital ensures that Boston Public Schools can hire and retain the people who keep our schools in operation, providing the, uh, the, providing the opportunities that shape the lives of students and the future of the city and the Commonwealth. I look forward to discussing how we can ensure our BPS union workers' contracts can be adhered to. As the Chair of Workforce Development, labor and economic empowerment and the chair of education these are issues that we have um, over the last year or so have heard a lot from uh, folks um, who are navigating the boston public schools and i think we have an opportunity to figure out what the issues are and support the schools to address them thank you thank you council mejia is anyone else looking to speak on this matter would anyone like to add their name please raise your hand Mr. Clerk, please add Council of Royal, Council of Bach, Council of Coletta, Council of Fernandez Anderson, Council of Flaherty, Council of Lara, Council of Murphy, Council of Rell. Please add the chair. Council Louis Jean, were you, did you want to be part of that? Oh, okay. Council Louis Jean. This docket 0725 will be referred to the Committee on City Services, Innovation, Technology. Mr. Kirk, can you please read docket 0726, please? Council Lujan offer the following resolution recognizing April as Fair Housing Month. Thank you. The chair recognizes Council Lujan. Council Lujan, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. President. I'd like to suspend rule, uh, request to suspend Rule 12 and add Councilor Bach as an original co sponsor. Councilor Bach is so added. The chair recognizes Council Lujan. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, April is Fair Housing Month, and it's a month that reminds us that the principle of fair housing is not only not federal law, but it's also looking at what we can do here on the city and state level, and that fair housing is a fundamental right for all of us. Um, as a city, we welcome all neighbors, recognizing the contributions and richness uh, given by a wide variety of people from diverse backgrounds, colors, ethnicities, religious traditions, um, and uh, gender identities. With this resolution, uh, the City of Boston commemorates the 55th anniversary of the passage of the Fair Housing Act, a landmark civil rights act uh, that made discrimination in housing unlawful. Its passage came only after a long and arduous journey fought by advocates around the country. Um, yesterday, we recognized and remembered the 55th anniversary of the assassination of Dr. King. And it is that um, tragic event that really spurred our uh, national political leaders into action when President Lyndon Johnson urged for the bill's speedy passage um, in Congress and was signed into law on April 11, 1968. Our very own Senator, Senator Edward Brooke, the first uh, black senator to be elected via a popular mandate, testified um, in, in the Senate about his own experience as a World War II veteran coming home and not being able to find housing of his choice because of uh, restrictive covenants and the role that discrimination was playing in the housing market. So um, I honor the legacy of all of those who came before, who fought for this um, and made our political leaders do the right thing. In the city of Boston, our own laws go even further than the national requirements, adding further protections to people. The city of uh, Boston, our policy says to see, uh, we're required to see that each individual, regardless of their race, color, religious creed, marital status, military status, handicap, children, national origin, sex or gender identity or expression, age, ancestry, sexual preference or source of income, shall have equal access to housing and to, and to encourage and bring about mutual understanding and respect among all individuals in the city by eliminating, the, by the elimination of prejudice, intolerance, bigotry and discrimination in the area of housing. We all know that, that even with the passage of the Fair Housing Act, discrimination still persists sometimes in obvious ways and sometimes in subtle ways. There's an article this week in, the, in Boston.com talking about the further segregation in our city because of black home buyers who face discrimination or are being um, outbid in the housing market here. And so it's something that we must pay attention to. Um, we discussed at our recent hearing on lending discrimination the paired, uh, that paired testing is a gold standard of a testing methodology to ensure that we are aggressively going after those who are discriminating in our housing market. And we need to make it very clear that the city of Boston is being aggressive in this front to let realtors, uh, brokers, and everyone know that we take housing discrimination very seriously. And so uh, we heard from uh, the executive director of the Fair Housing 
uh, commission here, Bob Terrell, about the need for us to have more testers, for us to have in-house testers, more of which we'll hear of during the budget process. So I encourage us all to be supportive so that we could do our role in dismantling um, housing discrimination in our market. Um, and I also encourage everyone to sign up. There are two events happening um, from April 11th to April 13th. There's a virtual, the virtual 17th annual for housing and civil rights conference that Bob Terrell is leading. There is also CHAPA's annual fair housing symposium on April 27th from 1 to 4 p.m. exploring recent fair housing uh, research and uh, discussing the actions that we can take to create the future that we want to see. And I want to thank both of those directors for being here at our hearing on language discrimination um, and telling us what we need to do in order to continue to uh, make sure that the Fair Housing Act is realized both on the federal level but what we can do here on the municipal level. So thank you. And I'm seeking uh, suspension and pass uh, today. Thank you. Thank you, Council Ouijan. The Chair recognizes Council Bach. Council Bach, you have the floor. Thank you so much, Mr. President, and thank you to Councilor Louis-Jean for allowing me to co-sponsor. Um, fair housing is one of the great unfulfilled dreams of America, um, and I think it is very appropriate that every April we really recommit ourselves to doing this work. Um, it's something that I'm excited to spend more time working on in the near future. Um, I think that uh, you know there's a huge role for the city of Boston to play, and especially uh, as we really try to make real what was originally in the law but really not made real over many decades, that responsibility to affirmatively further fair housing, to not just not discriminate in ways that people were discriminated against in the past, but also to recognize the many ways in which that housing discrimination has been encoded in our communities um, and to actively push against that. And so that means the things like what we were talking about in the hearing, as Councillor Louis Jen said, it means you know funding fair housing testing, making sure that folks are not being discriminated against, whether in appraisals or seeking to use their vouchers um, or just based on the color of their skin as renters. Um, but it also means that you know the affirmative piece is what are we doing in our inclusionary development to make sure that there are places for everybody to live in every part of the city? What are we doing um, in you know just in smoothing the way uh, for our voucher holders to rent everywhere in the city and everywhere in the region because the reality is that the, um, the failure to fulfill the promise of uh, fair housing has uh, been deeply felt in the suburbs surrounding Boston in addition to the city of Boston itself. Um, and, uh, and we can't solve that problem for all, all people in the region without really pushing beyond even the boundaries of the city um, and saying, you know, everybody should, have a, should be able to have a place to live um, regardless of their protected class uh, anywhere. And, and, and I also want to say, you know, this is a 1968, it's an act that comes out of, um, out of recognition of Martin Luther King and all the civil rights work and particularly the struggle of black Americans. Um, but we also continue to see substantial racial, um, substantial housing discrimination against our LGBTQ community, against folks with disabilities, against families with children under the age of 18. Um, so this really is a law where uh, fulfilling it takes a, a lot of work, but it, it kind of, it's essential to um, having a truly inclusive community. So I, I very much urge my colleagues to join us in passing this topic today. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Council Buck. Would anyone else like to speak on this matter or add on to it? Please raise your hand. Mr. Clerk, please add Councilor Coletta, Councilor Fernandez Anderson, Councilor Flaherty, Councilor Lara, Councilor Mejia, Councilor Murphy, Councilor Rell. Please add the chair, Councilor Arroyo, Councilor Louis Jean, and Councilor Bork are seeking suspension of the rules and adoption of docket 0726. All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say nay. The ayes have it. The docket has been adopted. We're on to docket 0727. Doc, <clears throat> docket number 0727, Council Worrell offered the following. Resolution to acknowledge and celebrate April 2023 as second chance month in Boston. The chair recognizes Council Worrell. Council Worrell, you have the floor. Thank you, Council President. And I'd like to suspend the rule and add Council Louis Jen as an original co-sponsor. Council Louis Jen is added. The chair recognizes Council Worrell. Thank you. Um, April is second chance month, and this, um, this morning, Rep Montano, uh, Rep Worrell, and myself uh, received a tour of the South Bay Correction um, uh, House, of South, House of Correction from Sheriff Tompkins, Superintendent Sweeney, and Jim Walls. Um, and the purpose of this tour was to hear firsthand the challenges and barriers that our reentry community is facing and learn about the new initiatives that the Sheriff Department has put in place. Uh, without second chances, few, few of us would be in this room today. 
We've made mistakes, learned and done better the next time. Some of us in this room, through our own lived experiences or hearing the experience of the communities we serve, understand that too many in our city, it feels like they didn't even, they did, that they didn't even uh, have a first chance. For many individuals re-entering the communities, we promise a check second chance to those whose decisions have led them to incarceration. Upon serving their time, some are often met for the first time in their lives with the support and wrap, wraparound services they need. And in too many cases, that promise of a second chance is still elusive as we struggle to meet the need and fulfill our commitment. We cannot fix this until we change the narrative of incarceration and rehabilitation. Not one of us will ever be perfect, but we are capable of improvement. Every one of us is able to reflect and grow. And we know that often it is a failure to provide those early interventions and structural change to solve trauma, violence, and poverty that lead to people to making mistakes. It is because of these truths that we must work to ensure that we do not define any one individual by any one moment. I've been lucky to work with folks who have been incarcerated, from talented chefs and real estate professionals to reliable, effective employees and thriving business owners. I've employed and contracted many who are able to change their own narrative and find success. Few can do this alone. Reentry and reintegration into society requires community support. It requires care, mentorship, and understanding. I believe that the US cr criminal uh, legal system was more oriented toward evidence-based reforms like education and job training instead of toward punishment. We have better outcomes and, re and recidivism would decline. Uh, this council and our mayor have made investments to support the work of the Office of Returning Citizens, including granting one million to organizations dedicated to supporting folks as they return home. Most of these grants went to organizations founded and run by those who were formerly incarcerated. This initial assessment is the first of its kind and speaks to the need, but that does not mean that we should take a victory lap. Returning citizens still face barriers that we, that we know lead to um, instability, and they try to chart a, a better path. They have little access to education and are ineligible for key services like public benefits, public housing, and student loans. It is our responsibility to ensure that all of, all of our citizens have access to housing that is affordable, jobs uh, that provide family sustaining wages, high quality public, public education, affordable and accessible uh, medical care, and an environment supportive of good mental, physical, and community health. The very things that can help prevent crime before it happens. We cannot dismantle the system that led to incarceration without intentional actions to address the root causes of crime and violence. As we recognize and celebrate this month, I encourage my uh, counselors to join together and show we fulfill our promises of a fair shot for all. And I'm, I'm looking to suspend and pass the resolution today. Thank you, Council Wuerl. Is anyone else looking to speak on this matter? The chair recognizes Councilor Fernandez Anderson. Council Fernandez Anderson, you have the floor. <clears throat> thank you, Mr. President. Um, thank you to my council colleague, Brian Wuerl, um, for the resolution. I would add that um, the carceral system is um, severely racist. It commoditizes um, black men's bodies and that um, the root causes for incarceration um, or how it disproportionately um, incarcerates black men, Latino men, men of color, indigenous men over their counterparts um, is racist and that we should look at the root causes of gun violence or any other types of violence or crime as, um, as racism. And how to prevent that is that what we do what uh, Councilor Morell said, that we continue to invest um, in our social determinants of health, in our communities, and dismantling systemic uh, racism and oppression. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor fernandez Innocent. Um, the chair recognizes Council Louis Jean, um, and I should have called on Council Louis Jean because she was an original co sponsor, so I, I do apologize. The chair recognizes Council Louis Jean. Thank you, Mr. President, and all good. I um, want to thank uh, Council Orell for adding me as an original co sponsor on this. It is incredibly important that you know, we recognize that we live in a city where there are 3,000 people every year returning home from incarceration. Those are folks in our communities, those are our loved ones, our cousins, our siblings, and it's up to us as a city to make sure we are putting the resources uh, to support folks so that 
the policy harm that has been created by mass incarceration, that we are addressing it with our city dollars and our city resources. So really grateful for the city council for the work that we did during our uh, during budget last year in making sure that the Office of Returning Citizens had their resources to staff up, but also to really th think about what it looks like to have an office that works in deep partnership with community-based organizations doing the work. Um, and I'm really excited, as Council Orrell stated, about the organizations that we're able to receive some of the grant funding. We're centered in the hearings here. We're centered in the conversations like Justice for, uh, for Housing, uh, like Crossroads Consulting, groups that are led by formerly incarcerated folks, by women um, who are formerly black, women of color who are formerly incarcerated. And so um, I think Councilor Rell and Councilor Fernandez Anderson said a lot um, that, I, that I don't need to repeat, but it just bears, bears saying that none of us are the worst things we've ever done. Um, it's also true that none of us are the best things we've ever done, right? We're all somewhere in the middle. Um, and what has really happened it, with folks who get caught up is a result of the continuation of systemic and structural racism from the times of slavery that really recodify themselves in Jim Crow and in our carceral system. And so um, really undoing a lot of that harm takes a lot of intentionality. And um, you know, sometimes you think about second chance, a lot of folks didn't even have a first chance, didn't have uh, the opportunity to have choice, or um, were really bound by uh, what was, what was and wasn't provided for them in school um, and um, in their neighborhood. So it's incumbent upon us to really think about how we're allocating our resources and how we're really looking out for each other and being each other's keeper here. And we do that by making sure everyone has the ability to thrive. So thank you for adding me to this resolution. And um, I look forward to continuing the work. Thank you, Council Luis. And the chair recognizes Council Royal. Council Royal, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just wanted to commend Council Worrell, uh, Council Louis Jen. Uh, for the fair chance or second chance uh, resolution today. I think it's incredibly important uh, what Councilor Orell put on the floor, what Councilor Fernandez Anderson put on the floor, what Councilor Lujan put on the floor about the reality that as we talk about crime and, and safety issues in the city, as we talk about people who have been uh, brought into our criminal justice system, that we address the fact that the criminal justice system is not a cure to the disease that leads to these sorts of bad acts, but rather making sure we are creating stable environments, making sure we are creating ways into employment, making sure we are creating pathways into good education. Those are the things that get to the root causes, providing housing, providing for people's needs, that get to the root causes that drive folks towards beneficial, productive, progressive, uh, in the sense that they are being progressive in their own life and moving forward lives. And so these are the things that I think are important to highlight. I'm glad that you did. Uh, and I look forward to voting yes on this today. Thank you. Thank you, Council Arroyo. Anyone else like to speak on this matter? Anyone else like to, would anyone like to raise, uh, sign on, please raise your hand. Uh, before we do that, uh, I'd like to weigh in briefly. I want to say thank you to Council Rell and, and Council Louis Jean for the support and resolution. As you might know, I had the opportunity to work for seven or eight years in probation at Superior Court and returning citizens as, as this resolution St state second chances are critical, third chances are critical, but we need to continue to work together to treat th those coming out of jail or prison, giving them the opportunity um, and, and a helping hand with services and compassion. Myself and Councilor Flaherty had a hearing last year on Corey reform. That's something we're going to do again, but also looking at what the city of Boston does in terms of its hiring practices to ensure people with the quarry also have access to city of, city of Boston jobs. So it's important that we also are part of the solution. So I want to thank Councilor, Council Rell, Council Louis Jean as well. Um, anyone would like to sign on? Mr. Clerk, please add Councilor Arroyo, Councilor Bork, Councilor Cletta, Councilor Fernandez Anderson, Councilor Flaherty, Councilor Lara, Council Mejia, Councilor Murphy, please add the chair. Council Worrell and Council Louis Jean seek suspension of the rules and adoption of docket 0727. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed say nay. The ayes have it. The docket is adopted. We're on to personnel orders. <coughs> Mr. Clark, please read docket 0728. Docket number 0728, Council Flynn for Council Mejia. The chair seeks suspension of the rules and passage of docket 0728. All those in favor say aye. aye. All opposed say nay. The ayes have it. The docket is passed. 
Mr. Clerk, please read docket 0729. Docket number 0729, Council Flynn for Council of The Chair seeks suspension of the rules and passage of docket 0729. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed say nay. The ayes have it. The docket is passed. Mr. Clerk, please read docket 0730. Docket number 0730, Council of Flynn for Council of The Chair seeks suspension of the rules and passage of docket 0730. All those in favor say aye. aye. All opposed say nay. The ayes have it. The docket is passed. We're on to late file matters. I'm informed by the clerk that there are five late file matters. Um, these late file matters should be on everyone's desk at this time. I'm gonna take, take a minute to confirm that. One person. Right. One person now. <clears throat> Thank you. The chair recognizes the clerk on, late. on the late file matters. Could you please read the uh, late file matter from Councillor Braden? Uh, first late file matter from City Councilor Liz Braden. Please be advised that I will be not be in attendance at the regular meeting of the City Council on Wednesday, April 5th, 2023, due to a previously arranged family commitment. The second late file matter. Oh. That will be placed on file. No, not yet. Okay. Yeah, Mr. Clerk, um, we're going to do a motion. Um, to add these late file matters into the official agenda. All those in favor, All those in favor say aye. aye. Opposed say nay. These late file matters have been added into the agenda. Um, the, the chair recognizes the clerk. All right, thank you. I'll reread the uh, late the letter from Councillor Braden will not be in attendance at the regular meeting due to a previously arranged family commitment. Thank you, Councillor Liz Brayton. That will be placed on file. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Clark. Second late file is a letter from City Councilor Kenzie Bach. Dear Clerk Jertens, it has, it has been truly an honor to serve as the District 8 City Councilor representing the incredible neighborhoods of Mission Hill, Fenway, Back Bay, Beacon Hill, and the West End. I have treasured every opportunity to make a difference for our residents throughout the COVID-19 pandemic and beyond. I am grateful for the partnership of my council colleagues and the council staff on so many important fronts. I hereby irrevocably resign from my position as the Boston City Councilor for District 8 as of 11.59 p.m. on April 28, 2023. Sincerely, Kenzie Bach, Boston City Councilor, District 8. That will be placed on file. <laughs> um, the next late file matter is, is it's the personnel order from Councillor Fernandez Anderson. Third late file uh, order from Councillor Flynn for Councillor Fernandez Anderson. The chair, the chair seeks suspension of the rules and passage of this late file matter, this personnel late file matter. All those in favor say aye. All opposed say nay, the ayes have it. This late file matter has been passed. Mr. Clerk, the next late file matter is a 17F. 17F, order of Councilor Frank Baker under the provisions of section 17F of chapter 452 of the acts of 1948 as amended and any other applicable provisions of the law, the mayor be and hereby is requested to obtain and deliver to the council 
within one week of the receipt here, hereof the following information relative to new City of Boston employees. Who has, number one, who has the City of Boston hired to defend the City of Boston in redistricting court case? Number two, outside of legal counsel, who else has been hired to testify for the City of Boston? And number three, how much has outside counsel and experts cost the City of Boston? Filed in the City Council April 5th, 2023. The Chair recognizes Councilor Baker. Councilor Baker, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. President. Pretty straightforward, just looking to get a sense on what, what is being spent on this lawsuit here in taxpayer money. So thank you. Thank you, Council Baker. Council Baker seeks suspension of the rules and passage of this late file matter. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed say nay. Nay. Mr. Kirk, we'll, we'll do it. Um, Mr. Clerk, we're going to do a roll call vote, please. Roll call vote on the 17F order filed by Councillor Frank Baker. Councillor Arroyo? Nay. Councillor Arroyo, nay. Councillor Baker? Aye. Councillor Baker, aye. Councillor Bach? Aye. Councillor Bach, aye. Councillor Braden? Councillor Coletta? Yes. Councillor Coletta, yes. Councillor Fernandez Anderson? No. Councillor Fernandez Anderson, no. Councillor Flaherty? Yes. Council Flaherty, yes. Council Flynn, yes. Council Flynn, yes. Council Lara, no. Council Lara, no. Council Lujan, yes. Council Lujan, yes. Council Mejia, no. Council Mejia, no. Council Murphy, yes. Council Murphy, yes. Council Worrell, yes. Council Worrell, yes. The 17th F order has received eight votes in the affirmative and four in the negative. This is passed. Yep. The fifth late file matter is uh, order of City Councilor Aaron Murphy under the provisions of Section 17F of Chapter 452 of the Acts of 1948 as amended and any other applicable provisions of the law. Her Honor, the Mayor be and hereby is requested to obtain and deliver to the City Council within one week of the receipt hereof the following information. Now that we are aware of a four-year request that produced 5,816 pages of redistricting correspondence, I request the documents, uh, I request the documents that were shared with attorney John Lyons per his four-year request on October 28, 2022 requesting that the City of Boston, through the Mayor, provide any and all information that is available regarding this matter. Filed in City Council, April 5th, 2023. Thank you. The Chair recognizes Council Murphy. Council Murphy, you have the floor. Thank you. Um, I'd like to start just by saying, um, you know, we all end up here with a past, a life. I'm 53 years old, and there's lessons my grandparents taught me, my parents modeled for me. And I have intentionally tried to model for my own children and the hundreds of students I've been proud to be a teacher of. It doesn't matter if you win, if you've hurt people along the way, then you have lost. And I just want to be reminded of that. And also, the truth will always set us free. And when we request information, it's just so that, for me, I can only speak for myself, decisions I make or assumptions I'm making are not based on hearsay, that we have the information in front of us so we can make good decisions. I wish we weren't in this predicament, but I also respect the sacred institution of the Boston, Boston City Council that I was elected to and that all of us in this chamber were elected to. Our staff is an extension of our offices, 
Our entire staff takes the state ethics, public records, and open meeting law training along with us because they are also expected to uphold the rules and the charter of the city of Boston. John Lyons had filed a FOIA request months ago. It was late Thursday that I saw a couple of the emails of the 5,816 pages that were requested through his FOIA request. And his request was asking for any redistricting correspondence between council offices and some staff. I'm not here going to get into what, what I did see or didn't see or how I feel about that. There is what Councillor Baker mentioned in his 17F, a court, um, something happening in the court. For me, this is different. This is the rules of the city of Boston City Council that we, t we come together and make sure that we upheld our responsibility to hold the Constitution, which we took an oath on in the Charter. So I am requesting that we get a copy of those four years. I'm not asking for different information, but just that we as a council are shared the same information that John Lyons, the attorney, has, and some people, not myself, I don't have, I haven't seen all of it, have, so that we're clear on what was shared. Thank you, Council President Flynn. Thank you. Thank you, Council Murphy. We're going to take a vote on this. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed say nay. Nay. Mr. Clerk, can we do a roll call vote? Roll call vote on this, uh, section 17F by Councilor Murphy. Councilor Arroyo. Nay. Councilor Arroyo, nay. Councilor Baker. Aye. Councilor Baker, aye. Councilor Bach. Aye. Councilor Bach, aye. Councilor Braden. Councilor Coletta. No. Councilor Coletta, no. Councilor Fernandez Anderson. No. Councilor Fernandez Anderson, no. Councilor Flaherty. Yes. Councilor Flaherty, yes. Councilor Flynn. Yes. Councilor Flynn, yes. Councilor Lara. No. Councilor Lara, no. Councilor Lujan. No. Councilor Lujan, no. Councilor Mejia. No. Councilor Mejia, no. Councilor Murphy. Yes. Councilor Murphy, yes. And Councilor Worrell. Yes. Councilor Worrell, yes. Roll call vote on 17F by Councilor Murphy. Has received six votes in the negative and six votes in the affirmative. Does not pass. Does not pass. Does not pass. Thank you, Mr. Clark. We're on to green sheets. Anyone wishing to pull from the green sheets may do so now. We're on to the consent agenda. I have been informed by the clerk that there are. I'm going, to, I'm going to continue. I'm going to continue. We're, we're moving on to the consent agenda. I have been informed by the clerk that there are zero additions to the consent agenda. The chair moves for the consent agenda as presented. All those in favor say aye. aye. Thank you. The consent agenda has been adopted. We're on to memorials. For Councillor Baker, Francis O'Brien. For Councillor Flaherty, Pedro Enrique. For the entire Boston City Council, Lawrence Brophy, who's the father of former City of Boston official Pat Brophy. Thomas Coyne of South Boston, uncle of Council President Flynn. A moment of silence, please. At this time, I'm going to ask my colleagues if they would like to talk about a loved one that passed away, a family member, a constituent, a friend. I'm not going to, I'm only going to ask you to talk about someone that passed away that was dear to you. We're not going to have any announcements. Uh, during this period of time. If anyone would like to highlight someone that's meaningful, important to them in their family or community, uh, please raise your hand. The, the chair recognizes Council Alara. Council Alara, you have the floor. Thank you, President Flynn. Um, I just wanted to honor my mother. The anniversary, the 10 year anniversary of her death is coming up next week. And I just wanted to invoke her name here. Um, my 
mother was uh, having a routine surgery at Brigham and Women's Hospital that had complications and was at Brigham and Women's Hospital for a month in a coma before we had to take her off of life support. So I just wanted to honor her. And I wanted to thank all of the workers at Brigham and Women's Hospital who worked very hard um, to keep her healthy. My mother was an undocumented immigrant. She came here alone. Um, she's one of 13, and I am one of seven children. So I come from a very big family. But uh, she gave up a lot and did a lot of hard work, did a lot of cleaning and a lot of cooking uh, here in the United States to make sure that myself and my siblings have the life that we enjoy now. So I just wanted to invoke her name here. Uh, wouldn't be here if it wasn't for her. So just wanted to say that. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Council Lara. Would anyone else like to speak about someone that's important or dear to them that has recently passed away? I would also like to, on behalf of the city council, wish the public, wish the wish our city employees a happy Easter, a happy and safe Passover as well. Would anyone else like to weigh in on someone that was close to them? A moment of silence for all of those that we, we lost during this time. The chair moves that when the council adjourns today, we do so in memory of the above mentioned individuals. We are now scheduled again to meet in the INL chamber on Wednesday, April 12th at 12 noon. Before we adjourn, I want to say thank you to the clerk, the assistant clerk, and the clerk's team. I want to say thank you to the stenographer. I want to say thank you to the city councilors for their professionalism today and your staff. I also want to thank City Council Central staff and um, want to say thank you for a, a productive meeting. All in favor of adjournment, please say aye. Aye. The council is adjourned.